Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another one of HydroTerra's webinar series. Uh, today, we're talking about leachate management, and uh, we're going to touch on automated monitoring and control and show you some examples of that. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about the uh, implications of the new EPA Act on leachate management and where we think that may affect some of the things that, uh, that we're dealing with today. All right, so next slide. So before we get started, just a little bit on uh, why we do these webinars. It's really about generating awareness of um, our knowledge, I suppose, sharing our knowledge and uh, also the knowledge of some of our technology suppliers and how that sort of technology can be applied. We do enjoy training our clients and that's a big part of what we do here. Really, we're trying to pass on knowledge on how technology can be used to help yourselves with what you do. Um, it's, an, it's a two-way interaction though. So in terms of... Um, what we really love getting out of this is those questions at the end. Um, so we better understand your needs in the industry. Um, there's no such thing as too much communication. So really looking forward to hearing uh, your questions at the end. All right. So today's what we've called 101 on leachate management. I will talk, um, a little bit about the EPA Act, the 2017 one, um, and the change that we see happening there, and a bit on what we think the future of leachate management might look like. And then we're going to talk in that context about the application of sensors and automation in leachate management and how that may well help with compliance in the new regime. Who have we got here today? Well, I've actually, we've got uh, three people, one who's not on this slide, but we've got myself. I've got a background in hydrogeology and worked in environmental consulting for several years, including some auditing um, around landfills, that sort of thing. Um, Yix, our senior project engineer, he has a strong background in electronic engineering and he configures a lot of our automated systems. And we've also got Dom in here today as well. So Dom assists Yik with uh, these integrated systems. So, sorry, Dom, you didn't make this slide. In the background, we've got Michelle, who is keeping us on track with the webinar. If you have a question, which we're certainly hoping you do, the Q&A button, the top of the screen there is how you can type in your questions at the end of the webinar or towards the end of the webinar. We will read out those questions and attempt to answer them. If we can't answer them at the time, we will come back to you with an email response. But uh, we better get into this. All right. So as most of you would be aware, the Environment Protection Act is changing. At the moment, we're still on the old regime. So I thought I'd just put that in front of us to realize we still have about a month and a half to go. Um, we've been operating under the 1970 Act for a long time now, and we're all having to get used to a new regime. Um, from Talking to various people in the industry, I sense that we're going to go through a fairly slow transition um, and there'll be a fair bit of understanding from the regulator as we all get up to speed with it. Um, things won't change dramatically in some instances. Some of these references in front of us will still be relevant, particularly the BEPM, which is that siting design operation and rehabilitation of landfills document. Uh, the licensing guidelines will, however, change. So what's the change really mean? Well, some of these, most of these slides I've um, got off publications on the EPA website. And if you do want to get more detail, there is a wealth of information there. Um, that slide on the left, though, looking at 
where we are now is the sort of navy blue slide pointing left and the emphasis of those regulations really was consequence based so if you polluted you had to fix up right so it was about managing pollution and we had all those things all those mechanisms there to make people clean up the problem with that is it's all reactive and we can operate in a bad way without actually causing exceedances until the problem's too late. So EPA thought, let's look at a different way. And so the new act is a lot more around prevention. And this is really very relevant to this talk today on leachate management. So it's about having systems to reduce the risk to the environment and human health. So what's the difference in emphasis here is, well, you must maintain those systems under the new regime. You can be, uh, you can be fine for not keeping those systems operational, right, regardless of the impact. So it's important to understand that. So we are now in a sort of prevention-based world as of July 1. Uh, next sort of slide over the... That sort of shows the split of how we used to do it in uh, a fence to cause pollution to land, water and air. And we had the state environmental protection policies and the waste management policies. Um, under the new regime, we talk about this general environmental duty or the GED, which is really our obligation as humans and as organisations to minimise our risk to the human health and environment from pollution and waste. So what does this mean? Well, we need to show that we're doing all things reasonable to actually achieve that. And that means we need to be able to show the regulator that we are actually running our systems in accordance with how they were designed. We're maintaining them in accordance with manufacturer's guidance, for example, these things become very important when you move into a prevention-based mindset. Uh, in terms of the actual framework, we now have, uh, if we're looking at the bottom one there, this um, regime of classification, transport, and a lawful place. Well, landfills are a lawful place to deposit waste, okay? now. If you're already a licensed facility, then it's most likely that you will still be at that highest level of um, permission, which is, is a license under the new scheme. So that's that last slide on the right. But I would urge you to read up on this um, on the EPA site. Um, there's plenty of documentation there. and We don't have enough time today to go into it in too much detail. All right. so. Having said that, I will talk about it a bit more. So the new laws introduce a duty focused on prevention called the general environmental duty. This duty requires you to take reasonably practicable steps to eliminate or reduce the risks of harm to people and the environment from pollution and waste. So of course, the really big words there are reasonably practicable. What does that mean? Um, this means when the new laws take effect, you will need to proactively manage the risks of harm as well as deal with the impacts of pollution and waste after they have occurred. So what's important there is it's not like the old world stops. We still need to deal with pollution, right? But what we also need to do on top of that is deal with the prevention piece. And there's a lot more focus on that. What's important to note that a breach of the general environmental duty could lead to civil or criminal penalties if you are a business or conducting an undertaking, even if harm has not occurred. So that's what I referred to before. So you need to show that you're doing the right things and you need to show that by, I think, monitoring and documentation as well as actually doing it. Okay, I mentioned before, I think that every license issued by EPA uh, Victoria requires a license holder to have in place a risk management and monitoring program. This enables the license holder and EPA to determine compliance with the general environmental duty. 
So what does that mean? It means there'll be various measures in our leachate management systems and our uh, environmental systems more generally on landfills where we will have metrics that measure the, the compliance with the operation of those systems. So they might be measures like leachate level on top of the liner, or they might be maintenance records to show that we're maintaining such things. So there'll be different ones. They've actually put some pretty big uh, penalties around uh, not complying with this, and those numbers are there in front of you. Um, I think we're going to see that that will certainly help us to focus more. This regime is a lot more in line with the OHS Act, and we've seen a, a transformation in how OHS has been dealt with since they they brought in some of those penalties. So it's certainly. Um, uh, going to get the attention of site operators. Uh, within that, uh, within that act, uh, there's a license condition. Um, well, not within the act, but in the license, it's the standard license conditions. OLG five states: you must develop a risk management and monitoring program for your activities, which identify all the risks of harm to human health and the environment, which may arise from the activities you are engaging in clearly define your environmental performance objectives, clearly define your risk control performance objectives, describe how the environmental and risk control performance objectives are being achieved, identifies and describes how you will continue to eliminate or minimise the risks as far as reasonably practicable, describe how the information collated in compliance with this clause is or will be disseminated. So what does all that mean? It means really the framework for how you're going to report back on the success of your measures to protect the environment. Okay, so it's how you're going to report on the performance of the various infrastructure that you have in place, for example, whether it's leachate pumps or sumps or anything else. So it's a really good idea. Okay, so this, I've sort of stepped back and tried to say, well, how does the world change? Well, the world changes really in that they've identified these four steps, you know, identify hazards. We've been doing that for a long time. We've uh, identified risks for a long time, but we haven't really done the last two very well, which is implement controls and check controls. And that's really where the emphasis of this new act is, is going to make a big difference to our lives. Okay, so if we look at um, the BEPM, remembering that the BEPM is still sort of referenced into the new regime, um, not much will change in terms of hazards identify identification. So when we look at leachate, management and treatment of leachate, the, the key goal is to prevent it from escaping into surface waters or groundwater, prevent offensive odours off site, and minimise human contact with leachate. So that doesn't really change. So a lot of the stuff that's been worked up over the years and in various you know, licences, et cetera, is still very relevant. With respect to stormwater, we try to make sure we segregate the stormwater, the leachate and the groundwater. We try to use, reuse it on site where it's practicable. We try to minimise any discharges to surface waters, and we try to prevent waste discharges to surface waterways so we don't affect their water quality. In terms of leachate itself, we need to have landfill cells to minimise the risk to groundwater by utilising a liner, and a leachate collection system, and a leachate extraction system. We'll talk about some examples of that soon. We also need a liner to avoid groundwater ingress into waste. You know, you can have situations where that occurs. With respect to leachate ponds, we want to be able to contain the leachate. We want to try and evaporate it, and we certainly want to prevent offsite migration. With respect to leachate disposal systems, we're really talking about options such as offsite to sewer, on-site treatment plants, or evaporation ponds. Finally, we talk about landfill capping and minimising the quantity of leachate generated by infiltration through caps. All of those goals are still relevant. 
Okay, so I wanted to talk about some metrics because this is where it starts to tie into what we actually measure on site. So the typical metrics that have been established as and considered as reasonable best practice, I suppose, at the moment, is a free board, which means that's the amount of uh, a gap between the top of your wall of your leachate pond and the actual level of the leachate within it. That's what free board is. Uh, needs to be a minimum of half a metre. Why? So you don't have waves of leachate uh, splashing over the walls, for example. You certainly don't want leachate overflowing. So that's a, cre a key critical measure of success of a, a uh, infrastructure component of your system, right? So we can use that as are we performing well or not as an indicator. When we look at um, the leachate, le the com BEPM compliant landfill cells, that's, and those are the ones which are constructed in accordance with the BEPM. Um, typically, the guidance we're looking at is the maximum head of leachate on the line of surface. Now, what's head? Well, that's just the amount of leachate sitting on top of the liner. The more head you have, the more downward pressure there is on the, the liner and the more chance there is for seepage to occur. Uh, people talk about Darcy's law as a way to calculate that. Um, so that's another important metric that still has a lot of credibility. When we're talking about cells that may have been constructed prior to BEPM being in place or they're not compliant with BEPM, we talk about different controls. We talk about using groundwater levels and groundwater gradients to ensure that we don't have pollution flowing off site. What does that mean? Well. A groundwater gradient is the slope of the, the groundwater. So if you maintain a level of leachate in your landfill lower than the surrounding groundwater level, then the theory is that the groundwater will flow towards that lowest point and therefore back in towards the landfill. So you won't have leachate migrating off site, which is just good common sense. So that still holds. In terms of leachate management or the extraction and levels in the sumps. So leachate sumps are really where you deploy your pumps to pump out leachate. Um, the rules of those are typically set in the um, hydrogeological assessments that are undertaken. And the, the control on those levels is set by typically automating your pumps to operate at a certain level within those sumps. Those sumps are designed to uh, remove the leachate. The leachate's coming through your drainage layer, which has that other criteria that we mentioned earlier, the leachate on the liner system of 0.3 of a metre. Now, the last one is lysimeters. So there is a criteria around making sure that the infiltration through your cap is less than that that flows out the base of your liner in the system. Right, so what does the future look like? Sorry for all this writing, I should have put a few more pictures in there. Um, to me, it seems to be about evidence that the site facility controls have been established, implemented, controlled and maintained. So you will have a document saying how you're going to operate the site, how you're going to manage the leachate, but you need to be able to show that that's been working and is continuing to work. And that the monitoring will be against the agreed environmental performance objectives. And really the intent of that is, are the systems working, right? Um, there'll be operational controls that are set to mitigate any risk of harm. Um, and these, sorry, uh, to an acceptable level, which under the Act is so far as reasonably practicable. There will be operational reports, data reports and facility maintenance reports required to really report on that, in my opinion. We'll also have reports which are a bit more focused on continuous monitoring and I think around completeness of data. So we do some of these sorts of facility monitoring uh, sites for heavy industry, where you're looking at a whole lot of metrics, which traditionally you would have said are more about operational metrics. And these, these are very important in the context of showing that you're maintaining these systems. So there's things there like 
data completeness. So have you measured at the frequency you said you would? Have you validated that data that it makes sense? And then you have summary reports of excedences and summary reports of alarms, which show you've been long compliant. Right, well, that's, that's the end of the slog through the legislation. Um, I hope I've emphasized it enough that this is really about monitoring operational performance these days, a lot of it. Doesn't mean the other stuff's not there, but that's the big change. Fortunately, that's um, where automated monitoring can play a really important role. I just thought I'd put this slide in. This is one of our standard slides that we put in around all our monitoring systems. The world is full of sensors for measuring various things. Under different scenarios, you, you select different types, but you know you can have cameras to see your operations and you can have them going 24 seven. You can have tablets to input data to uh, allow everyone on site to do manual data collection and record things. You can have continuous data to measure all sorts of things using sensors and telemetry. You can still use laboratory data. Mind you, if you're measuring operations of things like pumps and that sort of thing, that becomes less relevant. You can use things like drones to look at um, emissions through landfill caps. And uh, some people use satellite data to look at things like um, conditions of dams and that sort of thing. That's not really relevant to landfills. What I'm pointing out here is there's lots of ways to measure how your operations are going and they would seem to be practicable and reasonable. So I think there's gonna be an emphasis on um, showing that you do have a high level of oversight of the operations because it's not gonna be technology that's gonna limit that. You've gotta get that data back. So that's where we talk about telemetry and that's really typically using the telephone phone network or the cellular network. So that's that sort of 4G, 5G network. If it's a remote site, um, some of these rural landfills may not have reception. We can use satellite. And sometimes, rarely, uh, we may use a LoRaWAN network, which might be set up as sort of part of a smart city framework. All of that data needs to go somewhere, and that goes to the cloud. And then from there, that data then goes into either HydroTerra server or a client server where we use API links to move the data around to give it access to various software packages, et cetera. All of this is important in the context of automated monitoring of leachate systems and the monitoring of those. An important blob on this picture is the control automation. So you can these days use these monitoring networks to inform control of pumps and the like so if you've got a sensor measuring level, it can come back via the internet and it can still be sending a command to tell a pump to turn on or off. A lot of purist electronic engineers don't like that. I can feel yik squirming next to me. Uh, they like to have more direct control over those things using things like SCADA or even direct sort of switches, but we'll talk more about that later. Uh, remote oversight is very important. I think um, there's, there's enough functionality to see how a landfill is operating remotely these days with technology. That may well be one way of showing that uh, you are keeping on top of your operations. We've developed a bit of a process for documenting how to design such systems and um, that was set up more for in the context of HydroTerra develops a lot of uh, sort of bespoke long-term monitoring sites for research organisations and all sorts of things. But I think the same process is going to apply in this instance. So just going around this schematic, you have a manual which sort of sets out the rules for how you document your systems. So there'll be, it's a bit like a quality system for documenting systems. So it's got naming conventions, for monitoring positions, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also got naming conventions for instrumentation and asset registers and, and those sorts of things. 
That's important because you use that to help prepare your monitoring plan and system design. A monitoring plan says we want to measure this and we want to measure it at this frequency. Um, a system design says we're going to use this particular sensor and it's going to be integrated in this way. Also included in here is actual measurement methods, which are documented and are based on you know, Australian standards, et cetera. So that's a way to get rigor around documenting your designs of these systems, which can then go to the EPA for review or support another application. Once we've actually finished the design, we build it, and then we refer to that as a system specification. Um, that's your as-built documentation. And this tends to evolve with time because as we all know, uh, monitoring systems and components of those systems tend to need to be fixed over time. So components change. So this is really a dynamic um, inventory, if you like, of the, of the assets on the site, as well as how they're integrated. Uh, we then integrate all that into our software that we call data stream. And we have a management framework around that to ensure that the works are happening. And we have a service level agreement, which is specific for a site to say, you know, we will achieve X percent uptime in terms of communications and oversight, et cetera. That's important because managing these networks is significant and you end up with lots and lots of sensors. And even if they only fail occasionally, when you've got lots and lots of sensors, it's still a big job. So how do I think the world's gonna be running? Well, I think the bit that's changed, so I tried to think of how site operations might change for everyone. Really, most landfills have a site owner, most have a site operator, sometimes the owner is the operator. And then typically we've got an environmental consultant who's looking after environmental compliance. This person here is, I think, a new player in the game, which is under the monitoring and control contractor. I think there's going to be a lot more emphasis on having people around who understand instrumentation and how systems work and how to oversight them um, because there's, that's where the emphasis is focused. So I've called that a monitoring and control contractor. That's the sort of work Hydroterra does. I think there'll be a need for very strong collaboration between companies like ourselves with the consultants to make sure there's good alignment in the reporting mechanisms because we still have to report on environmental compliance, right? So um, I, I see that there's gonna be more work to be done. And uh, I think um, there'll be better environmental outcomes for that work. But uh, I think that's the sort of blend of the teams that will emerge. Okay, so what, what, do, what can we measure and uh, how will that change our lives? Um, this is actually drawn from a report I prepared back in about 2015, where we were working on a site which had too much leachate and they were trying to work out how to manage that for the long term. The picture on the left is really a bit of a water balance based on you know, sources of leachate. So you refer to the inputs like infiltration of leachate through the cap, um, infiltration of uh, through the evapotranspiration cap in this instance and infiltration through traditional clay caps. So there's a, there was uncapped cells, there were cap cells and there were um, transpiration caps on that side. So a number of different ways for leachate to be generated. We, we then identified the storages. So how much leachate was actually on the site and where was it? Was it in the cells? Was it in the transfer lines? Was it in the leachate ponds? We looked at various ways that leachate could be lost from that. So it could be trucked off site, evaporated from leachate ponds. Um, could be seeping through the liner. Very hard to quantify that one. Um, and it could be going off site to sewer. There were also other inputs. So groundwater was a big issue on this site. And there was also some potential for those cells to be leaking to groundwater. 
The reason I put that in was really on just about every landfill site, you're dealing with that sort of flow diagram. And I think a sniff of what best practice might evolve to is knowing what those quantities are at any point in time and being able to monitor them and show the regulator that, that you're managing that flow of leachate from start to finish. Um, in terms of identifying hazards and that sort of thing, this table on the right was also just an extraction from that report, but it, it does tie in reasonably nicely with that, with the framework going forward, where you've got to identify your risks, you rank the hazards, and then you look at how you're going to monitor those hazards. How will we actually achieve these measures? So. If you look at this one, there was a risk of uh, leakage of leachate through the liner. It was, it was a high concern and the head of leachate on the liner, um, I, was, I don't think we need to <laughs> extrapolate it from the sump leachate levels. At the end of the day, we had to come up with a system to monitor that in real time. And so that's where we set it on automated level measurement. And we had two options. We had bubblers and we had pressure transducers. Now, there are other options for that, but in this particular case, as part of this design process that we went through, we were asked to recommend various different devices that could be used to align with these risks and the operational hazards. Now, it's that sort of... Um, layout that I think is going to be very important going forward to be able to show what your operational measure is against, against these risks and hazards to satisfy everyone that we have a means of monitoring our performance. So on to some case studies, um, and this is where I'm going to get uh, Yik and Dom to assist me. This is... Um, this is a landfill that has many cells and it has um, a lot of groundwater sumps. So I just put this slide in to sort of show you what can be achieved. So this is a, a snapshot out of our data stream site, uh, which just shows you get a real time reading of the levels coming up on the screen. And those, those levels are are being read from sensors where the data has been coming back via telemetry and going into the data stream site. The parameters in the table at the bottom are important to note, right? So you need to know the depth of your sump and the depths of sumps do change, believe it or not, as they fill up with stuff. So it's always good to know what the, what the depth is. Um, they can get clogged up. Then we need to measure our leachate level and MBTOC stands for metres below top of casing. We then need to survey the top of casing to get this against a datum, which we call metres Australian height datum or metres AHD. That's very important because that's actually how the EPA want us to report on these things, but it's also important because it allows you to have a relative level versus all the other bits on the site. Um, so in the end, you end up with a bunch of metrics in metres AHD, and you end up with a calculated leachate depth above liner. So there's no reason why you can't have that data coming in continuously, telling you the leachate depth above your liner, and there's plenty of sites where we have installed that. All right, so Yik, would you like to uh, just talk a little bit? Here's some examples of sumps where we've set up um, automated monitoring of leachate sumps. Um, do you want to have a little chat to those? Yik? Yeah. So, so we got a few options to monitor the leachate level on the left. Like we got the, so typically we use a pressure transducer or a bubbler, or that is not ultrasound; it's actually a sonic sensor. But uh, we, we more like, like with, uh, I think the pressure trend is probably be the uh, most common type. Like, um, and the one we normally use is half like make of a PP uh, 
body, uh, like chemical resistant uh, plastic. Um, so to so, so have uh, different chemicals in the leachate. And bubbler typically uh, cost a bit more, but um, and but they have less maintenance put that way, like because they don't have electronics in the sum. So basically, we we run a, a bubbler tube, just a tubing uh, to the bottom of the sum, and yeah, so the bubbler system will have a, a compressor and pumping compressed air through, and then and then once the bubble escape from the end of the tube and we get the equilibrium uh, pressure and that, that converts to the head, uh, head of uh, leachate above it. And uh, yeah, so to, to convert that to, to a level. And uh, whereas the sonic sensor is pretty much uh, mounted on the top of the leachate sum, uh, normally we need a sounding tube uh, for it so that to get a, um, a uh, better Accuracy because the sonic sensors work on you know sound wave uh, reflections, and they work out the time for the wave to travel down and then will bounce back and uh, just work out the time of traveling and so that they yeah, maybe know uh, where the leachate level is. Um, and so yeah, so and then on the second one, like there's a pump pump. So normally we have pneumatic pumps uh, in the Landfill, like like big landfill, normally they have all this infrastructure ready. They got power. They got big compressors. Run all these pneumatic pumps, uh, you know, air well pumps typically. Um, and yeah, so so there's for for big landfill sites, and there's no problem to to put on those uh, to install those pumps. But we we did encounter quite a number of uh, small landfill operators, like run by council, and they don't have the closed landfill. Um, they don't have power, um, so they can't really run a big compressor to power up the, the air well pump. So what we did install was a, um, a solar pumping system, like we run off the power, the, sol the pump by solar, pump, uh, solar power. Um, and yeah, so and this is working very, very well and, and you know, it's kind of a sustainable uh, solution. Um, I think we've got a slide showing that one, Nick. Yeah. Hopefully it's the next slide. There yeah. it is. Do you want to talk to that? So yeah, so so that's what we set up back in 2019 uh, for Macedon Rangers Shire Council. Uh, and it's a landfill, it's the place called Landsfield. It's actually a, a golf course, a mini golf course now, I think like they, they it's a closed landfill and then they got no power. So and um but they got an EPA notice. They they need to um, manage um, the landfill, and it's actually on the newspaper uh, a few years ago. So 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 what happened is like they, they actually engage us, um, yeah, to design a system, um, yeah, so with, with solar solar panel and uh, solar power pump and to pump to extract leach it out um, to a evap evaporation pond. Probably at 150 meter away from from the ball, so so we install a pump, we install a level sensor, a smart sensor that uh, that control the pump on and off, based on the trigger level, um, and then we actually monitor the um, leachate being pumped out from the ball uh, using a flow meter, and all this data actually uh, being delimited uh, to our data stream uh, portal as online. So the client can always look at you know the legit level um, and get alarm say if it's uh, you know out of control um, and yeah so so the same council actually um, has got another landfill recently and uh, and they put on tender I think I think we're going to get it like from from what I heard like uh, so the the more 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 projects like using using uh, this similar technology. Um, yes, yeah, so, it's so it's called sustainable. It's energy. sustainable and, and reliable by the sounds of it. Yeah. What, what's the maximum flow rate you get out of that? I, it really so, depends on the pump as well. Like, so we put in a pump, this, this pump, I think it's pumping with 30 liter per minute or so, but but this this balls actually, they, they kind of low you, like they, they, they produce a lot of leachate. Um, it's yeah, it's typical. Like you know, we talk about like one or two liter, uh, uh, per, per per minute or or even less. 
it, it really depends on on the location. So so the the new the new requirements, the new standard, they have actually have like I got they talk about two hundred thirty kiloliter a month. Yeah, so about ten kiloliter a, a day. Right. Kind of thing, yeah. All right. Next slide. I hope everyone understands that one. So the reason um, to show this is um, you cast your mind back to the previous slides. We had a lot of vertical sumps, but you also get inclined sumps, which um, uh, provides another challenge uh, in terms of really establishing what elevation you've deployed at. So you need to do a bit of geometry to do that. But, um, Dom, do you want to talk to this one? Do you want to have a go? Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I think one thing worth highlighting is the, the benefit of actually having a telemetry system attached to a level monitoring setup. So yes, there's a few types of level sensing devices in terms of using bubblers or submersible transducers or um, some kind of sonic device. So they all have an output that can be used to basically a logger box. And if, if that logger box has a modem uh, and there's decent site reception, you can shoot all that data straight up to the cloud. And in terms of just being able to have eyes on your site, it's an incredible advantage because you can, from, from your office, access the web and see all your level conditions straight away without having to wait for site operators to go outside um, and realize equipment's not working or, or there's some kind of issue um, sort of a long time after that actual issue has occurred. So just, just being able to have the benefit of eyes on site is a, is a real advantage of the telemetry setup, not to mention the, the control option as well. So there's, there's loggers available that can have a switching output. So not only can you send uh, data up to the internet where you can access it from anywhere where you've got internet, you can also set up um, levels and thresholds where you might want to switch power to a pump. So if you're trying to, trying to maintain your leachate below a certain level, you can set a threshold value and it'll actually um, switch a relay to power that pump. And you can also set alarms. So if you have particular thresholds that uh, you don't want to be exceeded, <clears throat> you can set sort of staged alarms where if there is an issue and a pump stops working, you know straight away. If, if you have leachate coming up too high, you can set up uh, SMS or, or um, email alarms so you're notified straight away so you can jump on an issue before um, while you've still got time to rectify it. So, so there's a lot of flexibility with the telemetry systems in, in terms of just reading data um, so you can access it online but also um, being able to have that ability to control switching outputs for leachate pumps and um, a lot of versatility with what kind of sensors can be used in terms of just really um, accessing the information from the leachate level. And what are we actually looking at there, Dom? What's the device that's connected up? Oh, so this, this particular setup here is a, a bubbler setup. So as Ick was saying before, um, the, the really nice aspect of a, a bubbler setup is you don't actually have any electronics down the bore. So you, you just have an integrated level sensor and uh, compressor unit all above ground, all above the headworks. And when that compressor runs, it pushes air down the, the tube and um, you get your, your pressure above the end of the tube, which tells you your level at the end of the tube. So in this particular case, um, there's no automatic control here. We're just getting level measurements and we're just verifying that the existing pump in this sump here is actually working. And if that, if that level comes up too high, the operator gets a, an email alarm. And so they know to send out a maintenance crew to, to have a look at what's going on with the pump before an issue arises. So just a really good way to get eyes on site. Thanks, Tom. Um, we're running a bit short on time. We might... Um... Uh, move to this one. Yik, this was the site that's created lots of joy for you over the years. It's a lysimeter. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, lysimeters are used to estimate the amount of seepage going through a cap. This particular cap is at what they call a transpiration cap. So that's where you're using the soil and the, more importantly, the vegetation that you grow on that uh, soil as the capping mechanism. The theory being that 
when it rains, uh, the rain gets absorbed into the soil and then it gets retained there and sucked back out by the vegetation when the vegetation's done transpiring. So it's, um, it's an area I've done quite a lot of work in actually and, and done sort of numerical modeling of that. So you can use various models to calculate the thickness of these caps. But this is a system to directly measure whether or not it is operating in accordance with all those models. So do you want to talk a bit about what you learnt on this one, Nick? He's a bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, I just uh, provide all these instruments, and I mean, today I, I'm I'm not doing the reporting. So, so basically, we we do a monitor like surface runoff, like so we got a um. Uh, tipping bucket the flow gauge it's actually uh, a big big rain gauge right a big version of a rain gauge so measuring surface runoff and subsurface runoff Norm that for this particular side they they have a two meter uh that like the liner that was inside two meters so so and then they have they collect all the water um so they measure that subsurface runoff and then they also have the surface drain uh, another flow gauge measuring the surface runoff so and then then we got two um soil moisture probe at various depth i think we got six different depth uh, per probe and so they work out that what's the soil moisture content in the soil and then at the same time we got this uh, a weather station uh yeah recording all this like rain uh where the like wind direction wind speed uh what else and uh yeah and red solar radiation and stuff like that so um yeah <laughs> <That's, laughs> no, that was good yeah so just just for the the viewers so from left to right that's a little sort of microclimate weather station on the left the mm -hmm. the second one over is a, what they call a tipping bucket rain gauge it just uh, water flows down a funnel in the top and it clicks over each time and each clicks worth about what, point, point two mil. Point two of a mil and it counts the number of clicks and it can tell you therefore rainfall and rainfall intensity. The next one is um, where we're collecting the subsurface output. So there's that white pipe that the water comes out and it drops into what's essentially a, another tipping bucket rain gauge. One thing to note here with this one is there's a lot of sediment uh, that can build up in these and therefore there's a lot of maintenance that's required. So a, a, a big structure like this, like this lysimeter, this is uh, monitoring on steroids, right? It really is uh, a big project and, and lots of work. Um, as we move into this new act and, and what's reasonable, I um, think looking at other approaches for proving up transpiration caps might, might be useful too, like you can do a lot just with soil moisture sensors and a tipping bucket rain gauge. But um, certainly an impressive site. Um, we'll just tick along here because we've only got 10 minutes left. So these ones are um, flow meters. So on the left, um, that's a a flow meter on a stormwater. So that would be for ultimately discharging off site. Um, and Dom, do you want to talk to the one in the middle about the stormwater pond level measurement? Yeah, sure. So, so you don't always have to go like a full deluxe setup. So the, the one in the middle here is basically like a, a very compact version of a level monitoring system. So all, all we've got here is a level transducer run down the PVC pipe into the water. And it just runs up to a logger box standalone on the steel post there with a SIM card in it. So all low power uh, inside that box is a little internal lithium ion battery, um, which will last about a year. So the only real maintenance needed is the operator to come out and swap that battery once a year. And then it, it'll just tick away, you know, largely un, unsupervised and send level data up to, up to the cloud where you can access. So there's lots of options for monitoring applications where you may want many, many sensors out in site, um, but don't ne necessarily want to go for the full sort of solar power battery setup, um, which can push the, the cost up quite a bit. So you, you can have very small, compact, um, simple systems um, that will last a long time, low maintenance. So that's, that's one, one solution there. 
And you, you were pretty keen to have these ones in this. this mm. Donkey Kong. All right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. So the, the one on the right's um, a quite interesting of the type of control setup you can have. So in in this particular case, we've got two ponds. So the the box on the left is inside a pumping shed, which pumps uh, leachate up to an evaporation pond up the top. So there is communication between the two logger boxes installed at each site. So each site has a level sensor. And so we set up the two level sensors essentially to talk to each other through the internet. So one sensor down at the lower ponds will basically switch power to the pump once it reaches a predetermined level, will pump up to the top ponds, but then the top pond level sensor will actually override and disable that pump uh, at the bottom if the top level pond capacity gets too full. So that there's a lot you can do in terms of um, sites that are geographically sort of remote from each other, like two pumping setups, and still having communication of monitoring systems between them. Excellent, Dom. Excellent. Uh, groundwater level monitoring, I'm going to assume most people know that we can automatically measure groundwater level. One thing to note is you can automatically contour groundwater level data using um, data stream software these days, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, maintenance, the grim reality, it's a pretty boring slide, so we can skip over it other than to say, look, maintenance is a reality. And if you don't maintain these systems regularly in accordance with manufacturer's guidance, then the quality of data and the quality of measurement drops off. I feel that where the EPA is going with their regulations, that they'll be expecting a high level of maintenance and a high level of quality of monitoring and uh, servicing of equipment, and pumps, et cetera, more generally to achieve the outcomes they want. So that concludes our presentation on leachate management using technology. Um, and we have a few questions, which is good. Keep them coming. There's three questions at the moment. Um, okay, there's one from Mikhail Uy. I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Nilambic has installed a telemetry system recently. We have two leachate ponds. Therefore, bottom pond where the leachate from the landfill flows, the, the column in the bottom down needs to be pumped to the upper evaporation pond. The question, is the telemetry system able to set up conditions for the two ponds before the pump can be activated to prevent overflow? Yes, so that, that was one of the examples we gave um, earlier is that that can absolutely be done. So as long as you've got good cell network on site, then you can use the logger boxes that are attached to the level sensors to talk to each other, to switch power to a pump and um, across two different sites, yes. Good question. Uh, next question, I seem to miss one question. Um, how do you provide intrinsically safe telemetry equipment on landfill site given there is more intrinsically safe? None of the systems are intrinsically safe. No. No, in the solar panel, if you talk about intrinsically safe solar panel, they probably like, I don't know how many times more expensive. And and uh, yeah, so they're running on battery. I, yeah, we, we, we don't have any intrinsically safe battery system so far. I think there might be some out there on the market. It might be like I don't know, like it's just not just not common. Uh, I mean, yeah. So typically we don't have intrinsically safe systems. The yeah. bubbler, the bubbler itself doesn't have any electronics down the holes and you can run that tube quite a long way. So you can achieve a, a safe distance away from, from a uh, sump, for example. So there, there's some standalone units that will run intrinsically safe, something like the gas clamp, but not, not on telemetry. Yeah. I think we might, if we find anything else out about intrinsically safe uh, telemetry, we'll, we'll share a response back to you. 
Um, we've got Mikhail back again. <laughs> Uh, we had an overflow on our top dam recently. Um, it was before this different trash was set up properly, yeah. So that was before the system was yeah. set up. It's kind of like when we install it, like we we kind of like we notify um, the consultants about like we, we're going to do some monitoring, make sure uh, it's kind of like it, we we got to watch it like for a while before before you know it knows it's actually working properly, and there was an incident like it's actually overflowing because um the level wasn't set up quite right so we we actually fixed that level uh, threshold after that, so um but but that that was you know with so called teething issues. Okay, next question from Steve Cody. It seems quite, hi Steve, good to hear from you. It seems quite easy to establish telemetry when cell network is good. Do you have solutions using radio links and or hardwired connections where cellular is not so reliable? I suppose we can use this, um, well radio system is always there, but I don't know, like, um, the LoRa, LoRa could be a, a solution, but again, LoRa we, we still like is a radio system. Um, yeah, we are, we we've done LoRa for for the farm or agriculture, but not not on the, actually on the landfill side. We we do we do have some radio setups, um, but to date we found they've been a real pain. So by by a long shot, our experience has been um, we can get a cell network with a booster antenna is by far the most reliable. So, so yes, we, we have we have got radio set up, but not without difficulty. We did do that one in uh, South Australia where we had a direct um, radio link, you know, the discharge, the brine discharge. The new one? Yeah. Yeah. So that was all radio control, wasn't it? For the actual pump control. That's in the to their PLC and stuff. Yeah. Um, is okay. Another question from Mikhail. <laughs> we might bring you up, Mikhail. Is there a possibility to have a soft switch to turn pump to manual using soft switch via internet? We'll, we'll catch up with you after this. I think, Mikhail, just to have a chat about that. Um, another question Is it possible to monitor the signal? Yes, you can get you can get the three G four G loggers which do RSSI data back through to your platform. Yeah. All right. So I think that's concluded uh, the Q and A session. Thank you very much for all your questions and. Um, Mikhail, we'll give you a call about that soft switch option. But thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. It's been a pleasure to share some knowledge with you. Thanks very much.